here in this 2 age stand, a recently clear-cut um, oak pine stand uh, in Western Virginia. Um, and I say 2 age because you can see behind me, there's actually a number of retained primarily white oak trees. Um, so what we've effectively done in this clear-cut is um, created a 2 age structure. So now with the retention of these trees behind me, we're basically going to have a mature tree um, overstory with this regenerating cohort coming up beneath it. So a relatively modest concession from a timber production standpoint, yet something that can still have pretty pronounced impacts from a biodiversity conservation standpoint. And that's really what I want to talk about is um, essentially the implementation of ecological forestry principles uh, into your day-to-day -day management. Um, before I kick into specific examples of how to implement it, um, I wanted to lay the groundwork or lay a foundation um, of what essentially are the four um, guiding principles of ecological forestry. Okay, so I'll first just introduce them and then I'll define them each separately. So the first is continuity. The next is uh, diversity and structure. The third one is timing. And the fourth one is context. All right, so we'll go through those individually. When we're talking about continuity, we're talking about um, a preservation or a conservation of features from the pre-harvest stand existing into that post-harvest stand. So commonly in most working landscapes and about 55% of all forests in the world are designated as working forests. In those working forests or those managed landscapes, we actually see a, a decreased presence in things like large living trees and large coarse woody debris. So when we're talking about continuity, we're talking about taking some of what we what have been called biological legacies and carrying those over into the next stand. And that's effectively what we're doing behind me. This is a, um, an example of achieving that continuity, maintaining some mature overstory trees to exist into that next stand. So we have some continuity from the pre-harvest into the post-harvest condition. The next guiding principle is referring to structural complexity as well as diversity. And by diversity, I mean compositional or species diversity. The idea here primarily, and there's been a lot of research out about complexity in general, um, is effectively promoting a diverse assemblage of species as well as a diversity of age classes within your stand, so at the stand level. And now we can typically do that with things like two-aged modifications to otherwise even-aged systems, or we can implement something like an uneven-aged system. Um, but the idea being that if we show or retain or promote um, the full spectrum of species diversity as well as age class diversity, we're effectively hedging our bets. We're making sure that there's a species or an assemblage of species as well as an assemblage of different age classes that may be more or less susceptible uh, to an oncoming stressor or uh, disturbance agent. So effectively we have the means to um, maintain forest cover in that stand because we should have something that's relatively resistant or resilient to any number of different disturbance agents. And that's becoming increasingly true under this uncertainty paradigm where we don't necessarily know what tomorrow holds. Um, you know, you look at areas like southeastern U.S. where we have millions of acres of Loblolly pine plantations, or even look at the Pacific Northwest where we have a similar um, uh, species, lack of species diversity in what is mostly Douglas fir plantations along the western coast of uh, Washington and Oregon. Right now, there isn't really a, a known pathogen or insect that's likely to decimate um, all of those acreages. Um, but it could happen. Uh, there's new diseases and insects emerging and, and um, integrating themselves into our land or into our management um, seemingly on a decadal basis. So it's something to be mindful of. Those we would say would have low resistance and low resiliency to a disturbance agent that just targeted something like Douglas fir or something like Loblolly pine. Alright, so the third guiding principle of ecological forestry is timing. And what we're talking about with timing is basically the abandonment of this uh, more or less timber-centric approach to forest management. So historically we would use things like NPV, net present value, um, and the culmination of mean annual increment to basically determine when it made sense uh, to harvest. Basically when we were going to see diminishing returns in terms of growth um, in our stands that we were managing for timber. The timing in an ecological forestry context is basically abandoning those two metrics and instead focusing on um, the ability of these stands post-harvest to recover into a condition where functionally speaking they're providing 
certain provisions that are ecologically important. Um, so that could obviously vary depending on where you are in your landscape, um, either locally or even nationally. But we generally talk about recovery periods. So we have um, an instance in which we harvest and we would wait uh, however many years it took generally to restore that forest or um, allow that forest to recover um, into generally a more mature forest that's more structurally complex and capable of supplying the provisions that we're requiring of it. So that's timing. The last is context and this is perhaps one of the more complicated to pull off but particularly relevant for national forest managers. So for context Generally, you know, what we're taught in undergrad uh, when we're getting our forestry degrees is that we manage at the stand level, which is still true under an ecological forestry paradigm. Uh, but we're now also concerned about how that individual stand integrates itself into the mosaic of managed stands across the landscape. Um, so to back it up a bit, if we were to implement every ecological principle, you know, the retention of uh, mature features from the pre-harvest condition into the post-harvest condition. If we were to vary the sizes of our harvests, if we were to uh, intentionally diversify our species assemblages, all that's great at a stand level. But if we were to do that in every stand that we managed, we would still be effectively homogenizing our entire landscape. So what I like to say is, is you want to diversify your diversity. Don't do the same thing in all stands and think about how you're managing that stand in a landscape context, um, which is uh, a context that I think most that work for the National Forest will be used to. Um, generally, a lot of the management that takes place in the National Forest is going to have to be considered in that regional context, um, which makes ecological forestry particularly relevant for Forest Service. So an additional component of ecological forestry is Understanding a bit about the natural disturbance regimes that have historically shaped the landscape you're working in. The thought is, is that if you have a better understanding of those natural disturbances and the ecologies of the species that respond positively to those disturbances, then you're generally going to be operating more within the historical range of variation, which is a common term thrown around. And what we mean by that is staying within the bounds of the constraints of what was naturally found, the size and scale of, this, of the disturbances, the severity of those disturbances. Conveniently, there's a lot of um, details or metrics associated with disturbances that have direct correlation to what we do as foresters. So if we understand the scale of a disturbance, we understand the return interval, how often it repeats on that same stand, we understand something about the severity of that disturbance. Well, now we know something about how big our harvest should be, um, how often we should be harvesting, uh, meaning rotation length in many cases, um, and how much basal area or trees per acre we should be removing upon each entry. And the idea is, is that the closer we are in line with that historical range of variation, um, all the species that uh, co-evolved with those disturbances are still going to be capable of finding um, what it is they need to complete their life cycles in the harvest that you've created. So understanding something about the disturbance regime that predominantly influences your landscape here in Western Virginia, we generally have four or so agents that have more or less enacted simultaneously on single stands over that stand's life, historically speaking. Generally that's insects, that's disease, um, that's wind, ice and fire. I said four, but there's five. Um, generally there's been a confluence of factors that have largely shaped these landscapes. Now the historical paradigm used to think that um, intermediate shade tolerant species or mid tolerant species just needed a little bit of light in order to complete their life cycles um, and eventually ascend into the canopy. The more nuanced interpretation of mid tolerant species or um, uh, the silvical requirements of a mid tolerant species is that it wasn't just an amount of light but instead also um, constant and frequent perturbation. Um, so one of the going hypotheses currently is that in the absence of a lot of those disturbances namely fire being anthropogenically removed, but then the resulting densification has made a lot of these stands less susceptible to things like ice storms and wind throw. So we're trying to re-implement some of those disturbances on the landscape through our management. Um, and in the absence of a, a lot of those disturbances, we're seeing a conversion of a lot of our forest landscape to being predominantly um, composed of either shade intolerant species, largely yellow poplar, or shade tolerant species, largely red maple. Um, so again, this is sort of evidence that we've deviated far from historic norms and we need to kind of return to that. And that's effectively what we've done here. Um, 
So this is a pretty severe harvest where we have a fairly large clear cut, but we're trying to promote a greater presence of shade and tolerant southern yellow pine, which does well in these types of systems. We actually have a fair amount of scarlet and scarlet oak and black oak regenerating behind me. Um, some are seed origin, but a number of others are stump sprout origin, which again sort of um, is evidence of their adaptive capacities and their res positive response to uh, frequent disturbances like fire. After the harvest, um, this two age clear cut with reserves, they actually burned. Um, you can see evidence of fire all around me. So there's a lot of uh, charred tops, uh, charred stumps, as well as a number of top killed stems. Um, so again, it's sort of a, uh, a disturbance that's acting in unison. It wasn't just one disturbance cut and be done with it, but rather a number of intermediate treatments that silviculturally need to be implemented if we are to promote um, more of these disturbance adapted um, or disturbance philic, if you will, species that like a lot of perturbation and actually respond positively to it. Um, so a mixed severity um, disturbance regime is predominantly what shaped these forests, but it'd be important for you, regardless of where you're working, to have some knowledge, some working knowledge of what that predominant disturbance regime looked like. And it varies dramatically all over the country. Um, up in the Northeast, in Maine, for instance, Small-scale gap dynamics are what rain. It's usually small microbursts um, that took out holes in that canopy, so we can effectively um, reflect that type of disturbance through something like a group selection. Um, here, uh, because of that mixed severity, we generally have a larger scale disturbance, um, higher severity, more trees being removed. Um, and the rotation here could probably extend as long as 300 years or more. Um, a lot of our species are long-lived, um, and because a lot of our forest is managed under a more timber-centric paradigm, we oftentimes don't reach that age of biological maturity, um, which again is sort of a, um, a consideration to be made under that ecological forestry paradigm. So, if we are intending on managing on longer rotations, or at least promoting the growth of um, large old trees, which again tend to be missing on most working landscapes, we can either uh, extend the length of time before our next harvest, or we can create uh, these two-age structures. Here we're looking at a dispersed retention system. Generally speaking, in a dispersed retention system, you're planning on retaining these trees indefinitely, which means they won't be harvested at all uh, in perpetuity. You can disperse them like this, which basically means that you're getting some um, rather slight ecological benefit equally dispersed throughout your stand. Now a lot of folks that are particularly more timber-centric see this as a wasted opportunity, that you're just leaving value out on that site that's not going to be recaptured. Um, and not only that, but a lot of these trees, under their mind, or in their mind, are unlikely to live for very long. Uh, this, this full amount of exposure, um, either to direct sunlight and or uh, to wind, is likely to result in mortality, which is not incorrect. However, under an ecological forestry paradigm, that could be seen as a good thing. Um, in many cases, we're not only trying to restore large living trees, but we're also trying to restore coarse woody debris pools, which again tend to be absent on a lot of landscapes. Um, so if these trees were to die, they're effectively contributing to that otherwise diminished coarse woody debris pool over time. So it's generally seen as a positive. However, if you did have um, management goals that required a living energy source in the form of a living retained tree such as these uh, for long after your harvest, um, there are a couple of things you can do to kind of increase the likelihood that those trees are going to survive. You can retain trees in small or rather large groups. Um, and in doing that, you're actually increasing the wind firmness of those retained trees. If you put them in larger groups, you're actually preserving intact interior forest inside your harvested matrix, um, which can have a, a whole host of um, added benefits as well. Um, so some things that can be accomplished under an aggregated retention system cannot be accomplished under a dispersed retention system and vice versa, but both of which are um, uh, effective practices that accomplish ecological forestry goals. Um, so you want to maintain uh, or stay within the historical range of variation by as best you can at least learning from the natural disturbance regimes that largely shaped your landscape prior to European settlement. Additionally, um, a, a relatively modest concession um, that seems to have been accepted somewhat by loggers, at least locally, um, is the retention of, of large living trees within your harvested area um, to accomplish a lot of ecological forestry objectives.
So over the history of ecological forestry as sort of this nuanced novel management paradigm, it was established back in the 80s um, and has since kind of gone through its own bit of evolution since then. So um, originally it was dubbed New Forestry. Jerry Franklin is sort of the, the father of ecological forestry. It's been picked up by a number of different regions and sort of taken on a life of its own. Um, with ecological forestry, um, Mac Hunter and Bob Seymour out of the uh, Northeast University of Maine um, considered ecological forestry to be one leg of a three-legged stool. So the three legs of the stool were ecological reserves, um, ecological forestry, and intensive silviculture or plantation management. Um, basically under this management paradigm they were thinking of allocating land to accomplish the full breadth of all the forestry provisions um, that could be supplied to society. So with ecological reserves, you know, we may set aside some sensitive habitat, something equivalent to our wilderness areas and our national forest system. Our plantations, um, though probably not found often on public lands, um, that would be an important contribution. The contribution of intensive silviculture or plantation management basically effectively allows us to grow more wood on fewer acres, which thereby allowing more uh, forest land to be managed under ecological forestry or set aside as reserves. So ecological forestry was supposed to be a component of all this um, on a landscape scale. Now, a, a more recent um, uh, evolution of ecological forestry and its management, so we have the land allocation triad system of plantation management, ecological forestry, and reserves. Um, but Franklin and Swansby back in 2008 uh, came up with this idea of shades of green. Um, which is effectively a similar concept to the triad concept, which is something that's applied at a landscape scale. And the shades of green concept is basically the um, application of ecological forestry, but demonstrating that full um, uh, breadth of management intensity within your given land base. So in a particular national forest, let's say, um, overarchingly you may be still managing under an ecological forestry paradigm but you'll still have areas that are set aside as reserves areas that are still maybe intensively managed where timber is still the primary focus and then another contingent of your land base that's managed under ecological forestry so the triad concept was sort of this broader approach of um, allocating land use at a landscape scale and the shades of green concept which came out in 2008 um, was more so a concept of applying ecological forestry but still um, varying the intensity at which you apply it which caters nicely into the um, uh, implementation of that diversify your diversity. You may still have stands that are intensively managed, coinciding or coexisting with ecological reserves, while in the matrix in between those two, you may still have ecological forestry as your overarching nature paradigm. So over the history or the evolution of ecological forestry, there have been a kind of a couple of concepts regarding its implementation. The first that came out back in the early 90s with Mac Hunter and Bob Seymour was the utilization of ecological forestry at a landscape scale um, as a component of other land uses. So a landscape allocational strategy called the triad was put together and ecological forestry was intended to be one of three legs on the same stool. So we'd have ecological forestry or extensive management um, proportionally found more often across the landscape. Fewer acres would be set aside for ecological reserves, maybe sensitive habitat. And then the third leg of that stool would be intensive management or plantation management. Um, now plantation management or intensive silviculture, the role of that in this broader landscape allocational strategy was that by utilizing plantations, um, to grow wood maybe on our highest productivity sites, um, we could accomplish greater wood volume uh, extraction or growth on fewer acres, kind of alleviating some of the pressures that we would be finding elsewhere in our forested landscape. So elsewhere, we now have the remaining two legs being ecological forestry and ecological reserves. So again, it was sort of a landscape scale allocation strategy um, called the triad that effectively deployed these different management paradigms across the landscape with the idea of the habitat and the production capacity of those stands in mind. Zooming in now, um, in 2008, uh, Swansby and Franklin came up with this idea of shades of green, uh, which is effectively implementing that same allocational strategy but at a smaller scale. So the triad was landscape and the shades of green is generally deployed maybe within um, 
a forest or across multiple stands or a management unit. Um, the Shades of Green concept was basically utilizing those same three um, allocations from the triad but doing it at a smaller scale. Um, where we may still have ecological reserves in a stand immediately adjacent to a stand managed under um, ecological forestry or natural disturbance based silviculture. Um, and immediately adjacent to that, we may still have areas that we manage under um, a production paradigm or a timber centric paradigm where extraction is still the primary management goal. Um, so effectively, we, we have two different scales um, of the utilization of something like ecological forestry, both at the landscape scale as well as something a little bit more um, zoomed in and focused on perhaps a management landscape. So another element to be considerate of when you're implementing your, your harvests, um, you want to limit the amount of, of edge, of anthropogenically created edge via your harvests. Um, and the reason you want to do that um, is effectively the greater amount of edge that you have, the less intact forest habitat you have. And oftentimes, conversely, those species that prefer early successional pre-forest conditions or meadows um, are equally negatively affected by the presence of edge. So that influence, that negative influence of edge, tends to go both ways, both impacting those species that prefer open early successional conditions, as well as those that prefer intact forest. So you need to be considerate of the idea of area harvested relative to the proportion of edge. So what that means is, is that you know, a scattering of one and a half acre group selections it's effectively going to create more edge for a given acre harvested than would a relatively large harvest that creates little edge relative to the amount that you're removing. Um, so when considering the scale of your harvests, you'd like to consider not only um, are they reminiscent of uh, the natural range of variability, um, but are, are they creating too much edge and impacting potentially um, those species that prefer early successional habitat as well as those that prefer intact. So from a landscape connectivity perspective, um, sometimes conglomerating or aggregating your harvest into a larger area or um, a larger management unit that's going to be harvested more intensely can actually have a benefit in terms of land, land connectivity perspective um, on the species that you're looking to promote in your forest. Another way that we can kind of ameliorate uh, some of the negative aspects of edge from an aesthetic standpoint is feathering the edge, which this 2-H system has somewhat effectively done, where we have, um, in some cases, not a dramatic cutoff from where the harvest was and where the harvest now ends, but rather we're actually um, feathering the edge, meaning we're retaining some trees from that forest edge to the intact, unharvested uh, portion of our stand. Um, that gives it a more natural appearance and then also has a secondary benefit of effectively creating that 2-H structure um, that allows us to maintain some structural heterogeneity within our harvested area. So an intermediate treatment that's commonly utilized to accomplish ecological forestry objectives is what's called variable density thinning. Um, so it's an intermediate treatment. This is something that should be taking place during stem exclusion. This isn't a regeneration method of any kind. We're solely uh, concerned about residual structure and growth of the overstory. Now, with variable density thinning, unlike other thinning practices, um, we're actually going to modify and uh, diversify the intensity of our thinning throughout the stand. So it's kind of a form of free thinning but with the idea that we're going to try to accelerate some of those late successional features in our forest, meaning that we're going to try to promote big trees and other areas with smaller diameter trees. So unlike a lot of thinning practices, which is squarely focused on um, kind of increasing the, uh, the growth of your, uh, your capital, uh, this is actually solely and squarely focused on diversifying the structure. So adding heterogeneity into a stand that may not have much of it. So if we walk through this stand, you can see there's not a lot of regeneration, so again, obvious that we're in stem exclusion. We're excluding all understory species from regenerating. Um, but we see some opportunities here where we can thin and effectively increase or decrease the growth rates, um, or excuse me, increase the growth rates of the residual stocking. And in other areas, we may skip thinning altogether um, and eventually end up with this formation of what we call skips and gaps. 
So here, and we have a nice residual white oak stem here that would likely benefit from having its competitors removed. So these trees are nearly in the canopy, um, and if removed, we'd essentially be con uh, conducting a locally a crown thinning and putting all of those residual resources into this stem, allowing it to grow larger, faster than it would if we did nothing at all. Now over here, where we have a lot of moderately sized trees, a mixture of white pine, red oak, white oak, and some other white pine. Now this is already kind of a nice mixture of species um, that are already kind of growing in, in uh, tight configuration. This might actually be a great example of a case in which we would just skip we wouldn't conduct any thinning at all. We'd actually be promoting these smaller diameter trees coexisting with some of these larger diameter trees. Okay? Here we already have a nice gap, a, na a nice naturally formed gap that could kind of be developing in contrast to our relatively uh, tight spacing and uh, low thinning practiced just adjacent to this small gap. Now if we come over here, there are a couple of examples of trees that would probably benefit from being released in a thinning, um, as well as kind of a, a mixture of species that we don't normally want. Maybe some black gum, um, a dead or dying oak. And here, a fairly straight and potentially decent growing stock of white pine. Um, so here we may intensify our thinning. So we have no thinning at all, a skip. And now we might intensify our thinning even uh, more greatly to promote the growth of a, a rapidly growing um, and highly responsive species in white pine. So again, the idea here being that we're going to vary the intensity of our thinning in order to promote structural heterogeneity within this stand um, that would normally naturally exist in many cases um, in a natural stand that had time to develop. But we're kind of accelerating that process. So generally what we're given, or what we inherit when we're managing forests, is something that's been structurally simplified, generally through exploitative management practices, that kind of results in a fairly homogeneous age class, a fairly homogeneous size class. Um, and what we want to do is inject some diversity structurally into that stand. And we can effectively accomplish that with variable density thinning. So we're now in a stand that is part of what's called the Acadian Forest Ecosystem Research Program. And this is a study that was initiated by my University of Maine colleague, Bob Seymour, to look at ecological forestry options in this forest type. So when I introduced the PEF, I focused on the shade tolerant northern conifers, but mentioned that as site quality improves, we start to pick up some of the northern hardwood species. And that is the case here. We have a good component of northern red oak, and there are also some sugar maple and yellow birch in this stand. So the study that we're doing here is an investigation of an irregular expanding gap shelterwood. And what that means is that we are using even aged management principles to create and maintain an uneven aged stand. So this is at its heart a gap or group shelterwood. That means that we're coming in the stand at intervals and creating openings here about half an acre in size and then we return in the future and expand those until the entire stand is regenerated. What's different about this is that it has retention within the gaps. So there is about 15 percent retention of trees both as residual growing stock to be harvested in the future. So that might include species such as red spruce, which I referred to earlier as a two rotation species, able to live twice as long as some of its companions. It might include valuable hardwoods that have not reached their maximum potential, but it also could be trees for biodiversity. And that's part of what makes this ecological forestry, is you're sacrificing some component of your growing stock for non-timber values. So some of the trees here that we see behind me that were retained have large snags or stubs, cavities. Some are dead now and others are expected to die in the future. In addition, when these gaps were laid out, they weren't put in in a specific pattern or geometry that was determined ahead of time. 
Instead, what we did is come out and look for places in the stand where natural mortality was occurring. For example, where some balsam fir were dying out or other large trees had reached their maturity or where there was naturally established advanced regeneration. These groups or gaps were then established in those areas to both capture mortality and release the regeneration that was here. This was done in a way that was carefully planned out with skid trails that went to the gaps but did not drive through them. And that's extremely important. You want to make sure that you protect any advanced regeneration that is inside the gaps. Failure to do so will result in the opposite outcome that you're trying to achieve. In addition, unlike the single tree selection approach, this approach creates moderate sized canopy gaps and so will favor the less shade tolerant species. So by keeping the red spruce, the eastern hemlock, northern white cedar, you will regenerate some of those species either as advanced regeneration you release or around the edges of the gaps or in the nearby non-gap areas which we call the matrix but you have the potential to regenerate eastern white pine such of those to my right northern red oak and other less tolerant species i mentioned earlier the benefits of managing for mixed woods which are hardwoods and softwoods together and this is a really nice silvicultural system for attaining that so when my colleague set up this experiment, he had a target of a 1% disturbance rate over 100 years, which is what he determined to be his rotation length. The way that he set out to accomplish that in a manner that is commercially operable, because you couldn't remove 1% of the canopy every year through frequent harvests, is he determined that he would remove 20% of the stand every 10 years for 50 years and then not manage the stand for 50 years. There are other ways that you can do that, but the key is that when you average over the 100 year period, it comes up to 1% per year. And so that was how he determined what he was going to do. The way that he determined how much area to have in gaps is he knew that he wanted five entries over 50 years. And so if you have to remove the whole stand, doing the math on that, you come up to 20% removal each year. So the principles of ecological forestry that we see here is a disturbance rate over the long term that is based on that observed naturally. The retention of some trees as permanent reserves, also some trees to harvest later, but provision of wildlife habitat. In addition, when we look at the development of the new cohort in these groups, we see that there are some trees that are more abundant than we would hope for them to be. And an example of that is red maple sprouts, which we see here to my left. So in order to manage this, in a number of these gaps, my colleague has come back and done pre-commercial thinning with brush saws to reduce competition and favor those softwoods which he seeks to regenerate. So we have an example here of eastern white pine, growing closely with a balsam fir, overtopped by red maple sprouts. This is a situation in coming years where some additional pre-commercial intervention might be warranted to achieve the desired outcome. One of the things to consider in the development of the new cohort is the competitive relationships between the species that you're trying to favor and others in the stand. So here in front of me, we see an eastern white pine growing in close proximity to a balsam fir and almost overtopped by this red maple stump sprout. So this is a good example of a situation where pre-commercial thinning coming in with brush saws and doing some selective release might be warranted in the near future to make sure the compositional outcomes are what we hope them to be. Another consideration is what happens to the retention that was kept in the gaps. As I mentioned, some of these, such as the large white pine to my right, are intended to be permanent and will eventually die and become snags and then downed wood. That's part of the ecological objective of this. However, some of these are growing stock that wasn't yet merchantable and will be removed in future entries. And it's important to consider how you will access those and that you maintain your trails around the outsides of the gaps so that you can do that.
One of the questions that often arises with the application of this treatment is whether you should do any thinning in the matrix. So if you come in and create your gaps, you have an opportunity to harvest some of the trees that might die in between the gaps. If you do too much thinning in the matrix, you can establish regeneration of shade tolerant species throughout the entire stand and that defeats the purpose of trying to create multiple cohorts in a multiple age structure. In this particular stand, there was some thinning in the matrix done at the first entry to capture mortality, but there hasn't been any since that time. So that was a compromise between commodity objectives and other concerns. Over the long term, all of that matrix area will eventually be converted to gaps with retention. And at the end of the period, the new stand will be multi-aged with different ages of trees in different gap openings with scattered residuals throughout the stand. There are some things to consider when choosing trees for reserves, particularly when we want them to last for a number of years in the future. Some trees will die in the near term and that creates wildlife habitat. And we want that to happen over time. So having species or trees with different longevities can be important. In addition, stem form is also a factor to consider. So behind me, we see a red spruce saw timber tree that is a reserve. There are often concerns with retaining trees of that species because they are shallow rooted and can be prone to wind throw. However, if a tree has a long crown and a good height diameter ratio, it's more likely to be wind firm and persist in the future. In fact, my colleagues at the university did some research in the stand where they looked over the first two decades of the study at the fate of the reserve trees. And what they found overall is that 90% of their trees were still living after two decades. In these stands where you have canopy openings that are not very great, they have the idea that the wind is somewhat less intense inside the gaps than it would be in a very large opening and this helps to protect the reserves and allow them to stand for a longer period of time. In addition, retaining some reserves in proximity to one another might confer some additional wind firmness. So these are all things to consider when you're cho choosing not only the species and sizes of trees to keep for the long term in gaps, but how they're spatially arranged in the stand. In fact, folks have done some wildlife research out here and looking at the bird usage of the gaps, have found there isn't much difference between the gaps and the matrix, and that there wasn't a negative effect on birds that required a late successional forest. These all suggest that there are some ecological benefits of this type of management, and yet you still can have excellent potential for commodity production and efficient operations centered in gaps on a return interval that is sufficient for an operable harvest.